Good morning and welcome to our service this morning for the sixth Sunday of Easter. I'm Sean. I'm still church warden at St Thomas Beckett Church in Ramsey. Was re-elected for a, another year, Sunday just passed, in our annual church meeting where we have to do all these legal bits and pieces. Um, we also had a lovely tea and cakes on Saturday afternoon that the flower group put on and they're raising money towards buying flowers for our annual flower festival which takes place at the end of August. Lovely. It's lovely when the church is decorated with flowers and they're so talented. I'm not. I think my flower ranging is about a few branches and twigs and stalks of flowers stuck in a vase. I'm no good at arranging them at all. So welcome to our service this morning. This is your day and we shall praise you. This is your day and we shall declare your name. This is your day and we shall worship you, risen Saviour and our King. So welcome to the service today. We're going to start with a reading from the book of Acts, which is something that seems to happen a lot between Easter and Pentecost. And if you remember last week, we were saying that very much from Acts, it's Acts, acts of the Spirit, rather than necessarily Acts of the Apostles. So today we're going to have a little reading from Acts. We're going to be in chapter 10. And we're going to start at verse 44 and just read through to the end, just a few verses. So if you want to pause the recording and grab your own Bible, please do so. This is Acts chapter 44. Sorry, chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even onto the Gentiles. For well, they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So today, in that reading we've just had from Acts, we find Peter telling Gentiles, foreigners, Peter's not considered one of us, all about Jesus. It's the only story Peter really wants to tell, that remarkable and extraordinary story of Jesus. And Peter, now filled with the power of the Spirit, is speaking of Jesus, not just to his friends, his family, his associates, but importantly, the Gentiles. Strangers. Foreigners. Talking to unlikely people like Cornelius, the Roman soldier convert. How Peter has changed and how Cornelius has changed too. Just think a minute, if we're honest, perhaps when we've been away on holiday or living abroad, we might have been the foreigners. How did it feel? What difference does it make to us when we feel perhaps that we don't belong? In a few words here in Acts, Peter gladly tells listeners of Jesus' earthly story. We can imagine him telling and retelling Jesus' story with excitement, bringing colourful details designed to encourage his listeners to see things differently. Peter is asking them to take an alternative view of life, as seen through Jesus' window of love. Peter had developed a new personal faith. He now understood so much more than ever before. Peter had developed a reverent hold of everything which had happened. Finally, understanding the meaning of life as seen through Jesus' window of love. Peter had developed a new personal faith. He understood so much more now than ever before. He developed this real understanding about what had happened, understanding the meaning of light in the spirit of God. 
Peter, as an observer, a participant in Jesus' ministry, now saw with God. He, like so many of us, had gone through this period of doubt, dissatisfaction, disorientation. In his time of revelation, he needed to tell everyone his unique and powerful story. Peter, resting with God, even in the eye of the Roman storm, told Jesus' story. And this story included Jesus' terrible death and his glorious resurrection. Peter encouraged his hearers not just to live, listen passively, to bear testimony. In other words, to tell everyone the truth. He wanted to share his gift of faith. Jesus was indeed sent by God for everyone. <laughs> I wonder how Peter the fisherman felt in this new role. Who might have been looking after his fishing business, I think. What if he found it easy to bear testimony himself, to lead, to preach, to teach in an occupied land? Well, and then something amazing happens. We learn in today's Acts reading that the Holy Spirit visits these people, the foreigners, the Gentiles. The Spirit enters people who are not of the Jewish faith. Peter's hearers then spoke in tongues. In other words, they spoke in many languages they'd never used before. And they use those strange languages to praise God. They all bore testimony. Here we encounter things we don't understand. They don't fit into our constructs, our paradigms, our worldviews or thought systems. There's no way to properly explain, to capture this event in words. We must simply stand in awe and see this amazing event as an eye of the storm moment. It was as if the people present were all being baptised by the Holy Spirit, bathed by the power of the Spirit, not immersed in ordinary water. It was as if there were no barriers between God and the Gentile baptism, just as there are no barriers to prevent us basking in the power of God's love. No gaps in wonder and awe between heaven and God's kingdom on earth. In Acts, we discover that the Holy Spirit had already been experienced by believers in Jerusalem and in Samaria. That's in Acts 2 and Acts chapter 8. And in today's reading, we can witness the Holy Spirit being felt by Romans and to people hailing from India, Arabia and elsewhere in the then known world. The Gospel Spirit offering profound joy and defying all rational explanations is spreading like wildfire. In the Nicene Creed, we hear that the Holy Spirit is the Lord, giver of life. In the beginning, it was the Spirit which first visualised creation, breathed life into it. We can imagine a mountaintop view with God somehow seeing all the beauty of the earth. The Spirit works to breathe new life into all of us too. The many gifts of the Spirit will flow freely into our lives we open ourselves up to God's creative project. This same spirit acted within Jesus in the tomb. It passes seamlessly into each of us if we are prepared to follow Jesus. Martin Luther talked of the Holy Spirit breathing life into him through the gospel. But there are so many other ways that the spirit works here today. The spirit can and does move continually through the mess of human history. It moves into the struggles of human politics, into the ugliness of human injustice and bigotry, even into the tragedy of human violence and war. It's Jesus, even today, working in the world through his spirit-filled followers, whoever they may be. There were. There are no longer ethnic, geographical, moral or cultural barriers to prevent people being offered God's love, God's forgiveness, God's new life. There we witness the gospel invitation is open to all. God, through the power of the gospel story and the Holy Spirit welcomes, forgives and transforms anyone's life. If we are willing to welcome him. You don't have to be part of any exclusive club or tribe. God loves 
he forgives, he welcomes everyone from everywhere. If we as Christians are to speak wisely of God as King and about Jesus as Lord, we need also to speak of something radically new and different. We also need to encounter the Holy Spirit and think about what that extraordinary concept, the Holy Spirit, means to us in our lives. I wonder what comes to mind for you when you hear the phrase the Holy Spirit. Is it for you associated with something strange and magical? Or might the Spirit be something you've already felt in your life? Well, by the time Acts was written, Jesus had already come into the world, died and been raised, of course. Things were radically different in a newly transformed world. Some things remained the same as ever. People needed to gather to reaffirm their faith in worship, to join with God and others in compassion, bringing to his service their heads, hearts, eyes, ears and their spirits. Jesus remains a fundamental element in our creator God. This God does not destroy the traditional Jewish wisdom, completes the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit in Jesus is the refreshment, the completion, the ancient and the fundamental Jewish idea of the creator God who breathed the Holy Spirit into creation. The same Holy Spirit who is present at creation was there at Jesus' baptism, in his tomb and at Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit is with us today. It's fundamental, an aspect of God's working in the way the world is. But this aspect of God is actually far from simple. Real things are not simple, and any scientist will tell you. They may seem simple enough, like a fire or a dove or the wind. Look closely, and they're not. In a book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis called God the something behind the material universe, an unknown and unknowable power. The Holy Spirit is a vital element in God's amazing ancient project of salvation. The Holy Spirit is working as part of a new framework of relationships which God has created through Jesus and in which we, in turn, are asked to recreate here as disciples. The presence of the Holy Spirit is a crucial element in true Christian life. The Spirit is not some sort of abstract thing. Indeed, the Holy Spirit is not primarily a thing that God gives us. Rather, the Holy Spirit is a way of God giving of himself, much more special than a solid gift. In giving of his Son, Jesus Christ, God gives himself. The Spirit, although powerful, is not a force, but the essence of person being of. The Spirit pours love into our hearts as a transformational essence. Like a divine postman leaving letters on our mats and moving on, by a loving God offering us opportunities for new life which are open to us. Opening our eyes to the glory of Christ's spirit in our lives. So we are empowered to testify with a warmth of certain love, enabling us to live in the Holy Spirit. And may we all feel such empowerment in our lives. Amen. And now we'll look at today's gospel reading, which is taken from John chapter 15. And um, we're going to start at verse 9 and read to verse 17. Again, if you'd like to open this up in your Bible, pause the recording and do so. This follows on from the reading last week, which was about Jesus being the vine and his father being the gardener and we being the branches. We need to stay attached to the vine. I think if the reading last Sunday sort of ended on a, a note of the disciples glorifying God the Father through bearing much fruit, then I think in this reading today, that fruit sort of bursts open. There's a veritable flood in the exercise of love. 
So I'm going to read now from John's Gospel, chapter 15, and starting at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, but he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. You do what I command. No longer I call you servant, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I think this is probably a really, really familiar reading, and I'm thinking perhaps if I ask, any Christian today, what's the greatest commandment in the Bible? The answer would probably be to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. Or maybe they might say, do unto others you would, as you would have them do unto you. It's out of Matthew and Luke. Well, before I became a Christian, I didn't really know that was a saying from the Bible. I just thought it was a good rule to live your life by. My greatest commandment, according to that gospel reading of John, is that we love one another as Christ has loved us. When we think about the consequences of such a love, we may quietly admit to ourselves, I don't think I could ever love others to the full extent that Jesus loves me. Can anyone actually fulfil this commandment? In the passage before Jesus' command to love each other as I have loved you, Jesus is speaks about the foundation of that love. I used to think I was Christian because I was born in the UK, but obviously that's not the case. I also, I can remember as a child, used to wonder why God created all of us, but then Jews were his chosen people. And often the Jews didn't seem to value that we his chosen people. I really used to think it was a bit unfair. I would never be special to God just because of where I was born. Well, obviously Jesus changed that. And we can see the link now between this reading and the reading back into that one from Acts when Peter's out there preaching the gospel in Caesarea. And just as in Pentecost, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. But remember, these people were Gentiles. And those with Peter are actually quite astounded. But Peter, he's gone from that simple fisherman. He knows that the gospel is for all people. Stereotypes are nothing new. Early church believers had very fixed ideas about who was included in their community. And their ideas were challenged so that the church could grow. Do we or can we open our minds, our hearts, our doors to new people? like the Apostle Peter, <laughs> we might be surprised about what God has got in store. And just a little story to finish. This is a story about a soldier in the First World War who asked his officer if he could go out into no man's land between the trenches to bring in one of his friends who lay seriously wounded there. You can go, said the officer. If it's not worth it, your friend's probably died. You're only going to throw your own life away. The man went. Somehow he managed to get to his friend, lift him onto his shoulder and bring him back to his own trench. The two of them tumbled together and lay in the bottom of the trench. The officer looked very sympathetically on the would-be rescuer and then he said, <laughs> told you it wouldn't be worth it. Your friend's dead. And now you're mortally wounded. It was worth it, though, sir, he said. 
do you mean, worth it? Some of your friends did. Yes, sir, said so. But it was worth it because when I got to him, he was still alive. And he said to me, Jim, I knew you'd come. So let us bring ourselves to God now. Let us point our minds to our thoughts and open ourselves up to hearing from our Heavenly Father. God is present with us now, here as we listen to this online service. Let us bring him our prayers and our concerns, both for God's church, for the world and for the people he has created. Loving God, breathe new life into your church here on earth so that we too, like Peter, may speak with passion of your love for the world. May we be willing to testify, to follow, to suffer and to sacrifice. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, we pray today for your peace in all the troubled areas of the world. We pray that people may feel your spirit and learn to work together in cooperation. May they be sensitive to the needs of others and recognise you in cultural differences. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, breathe on us the spirit of patience and forgiveness. May these qualities be present in our homes, churches, our communities and in our relationships. May we all learn to cherish and respect one another, seeing Christ in people. May we always act in the spirit of generosity, sharing those gifts which you have given us. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, breathe your spirit into the souls of those who are sick and dying. Comfort them and to make them welcome knowing that death is the door through which we find you, anticipating the joy of eternal life to live through your spirit. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, breathe your spirit into our daily lives, wherever we are in the world, so that with you, secure in our faith, we rejoice on our journey every step of the way. Willingly share your love with others in our community. Whatever difficulties we may encounter on our life's journey, we know you always walk with us. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, be with those known to you who need your comfort. Be present for troubled people we know and we name here in our hearts. Be with those who need your encouragement so that in dark and painful times they experience strong spiritual growth in the times of trouble. Spirit of God, let your will be done. Loving God, we thank you for loving us. You passed with the Spirit through death to a new life. We rejoice in the power of your Spirit among us and in your victory over the powers of evil. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And can we join in together to say the prayer? So our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And just to finish our service for today, which has been around that love, that love of Jesus, the love that actually passes all of our understanding. And to think about sometimes, I think in some cultures, certainly in mine here in the in the UK, I think there are perhaps a couple of myths sometimes out there about love. For example, sometimes people think if you disagree with somebody about you know, they have a different lifestyle or they have a different culture or there's something about them, the language is different. You've either got to fear them or hate them. And also, I think naively sometimes we think that if we love somebody, then we've got to agree with everything they say and believe in. Um, I think both of these are not true. You don't have to compromise your convictions to be a compassionate, loving person. Loving others is hard. If it was easy, it wouldn't be worth it, which is why God calls us to it. He is our example when we are confident in his love for us and we are truly able to love one another. Then. So that through the power of the Spirit, that's within us, let us love one another today, tomorrow, and the week ahead, and in doing so, to become more like Jesus. So may God bless you all wherever you are, and hopefully, God willing, I will see you next Sunday for our service then. Bless you. <laughs>